So today I'm going to talk about um, deformation and texture. And by texture, I mean a polycrystalline material in which the crystals are not distributed at random. And you'll see that it's very difficult, in fact, to obtain a completely random set of polycrystals because of the things that we do to materials. And there can be enormous advantages in having non-random orientations of polycrystalline materials. So here, for example, uh, we have uh, cans. Okay, So these are deep drawn cans. And when I was little, if you bought a Coke can, it would be made from a sheet which is then soldered here and then you attach a bottom and the top. Now the whole thing is just a single object and it's so thin that you know if you tear it and touch the edge you're likely to get seriously injured. Okay? Uh, so the reason why we can do this uh, deep drawing, so never you know smash your can on your head as you've seen on uh, TV. Uh, so, the reason why you can do this kind of forming uh, without fracturing the material is because you arrange the crystals in such a way that the deformation is optimized in the plane of the sheet and you don't get a plastic instability in the thickness direction. Similarly, if you look uh, at your car door here, uh, this is from a mini then it's actually made out of a single piece of steel and formed into an incredibly complex shape. And there's a huge amount of work to get the texture of that steel correct so that you can actually form it without causing cracks or edge cracks, etc. Okay? So that is like near net shape manufacturing where you start with a plain piece of sheet and then you produce your product immediately. Inside here, you will also see uh, a bar. I, I don't know if you can see that very easily. Uh, but if I ask you a question, has the weight of a car increased over the last 15 years or decreased? A typical, hmm? And do you know why? Safety, Safety yeah. The most important thing is uh, that you now uh, have to be able to resist crashes from the side and front and so forth and so on, so that the <coughs> passenger compartment remains more or less intact. But in the process, the car absorbs a huge amount of energy and, you know, it's a write-off, but you can walk out of the car. And this bar over here is designed for side impact and the texture in that bar and the strength of that bar matters a lot because uh, it's not simply there to resist the impact but to transmit the forces to the rest of the body so that the body absorbs energy. Okay? And all, all of these things depend on crystallographic texture and how we control it. In aluminium, you know, it's a big thing to control the texture because aluminium doesn't have many phase transformations. Uh, it has precipitation reactions. But by controlling the texture, you can make uh, make uh, cans which are extremely deep. Now, the reason why uh, baked beans cans are not uh, uh, made out of aluminium, do, do, do you know why? Because yeah, the Coke cans and so on, they have pressure inside them, so they can support the weight of uh, other cans that you stack on them. But if you didn't have that pressure, you couldn't do that. They're so thin, so incredibly thin. Uh, now, baked beans, doesn't have pressure in it, so it's made out of steel. Okay, you know, steel has the strength to support the tins without uh, internal pressure. Okay, so uh, let's just think about how how uh, textures arise. Uh, you may be familiar with this diagram. It represents the deformation of a single crystal. So we have a, a single crystal here, and uh, it will have a slip play a slip system of some sort, all right? So a plane and the direction defines a slip system. And we've applied a force over here. Cross-sectional area is A. And we have to resolve that force onto the slip plane and in the slip direction to see whether that slip system will be activated when we compare with other variants of that slip system. So I want to work out the uh, 
force uh, uh, the stress, the shear stress on this plane. So I'll resolve the force onto the slip plane in the slip direction and divide by the cross sectional area okay, to give me the shear stress. So the slip plane area is simply A over cos phi. Yeah? The, uh, if, if, uh, if your uh, angle phi is 0, then the area is simply the cross sectional area of the cylindrical crystal. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So then uh, I resolve the force onto the slip direction. So that will be F cos lambda. And therefore, the shear stress is simply F cos lambda divided by uh, A into cos phi. Okay. And if you rearrange that, we call cos lambda cos phi as the Schmidt factor. Right? Now, um, on, on the website that's given in your uh, lecture handout, um, you know, the teaching.html. You can actually download the entire book, uh, original book by Schmidt and Boas, which is on crystal plasticity. Uh, and the Schmidt factor, the larger the Schmidt factor, the greater is the resolved shear stress. So say you have 24 variants of the same slip system, then you can work out what the resolved shear stress will be on each of those. And the one that will operate will be the one with the maximum Schmidt factor. Now, what values of lambda and phi do you think cos lambda cos phi will be a maximum? <coughs> yeah, when both lambda, uh, you can prove this for yourself. Uh, when lambda and phi are both 45 degrees, cos lambda cos phi will be a maximum. Right now, um, I explained that the way you would uh, determine which uh, slip system operates is by working out the maximum value of the Schmidt factor. There is another uh, important observation is that when we apply the force and a particular slip system operates, okay, here we are, we have operated this slip system and the shear direction here is S represented by a vector S whose magnitude is the displacement along the shear direction and uh, its direction is of course along the shear direction which could be the Burgers vector of the dislocation that's doing the slip. So your original force axis effectively is rotated to a new position F dashed by displacing one half of the crystal with respect to the other because uh, it's obvious from this. And the three quantities F dash, F and alpha S are related by a simple linear equation. In other words, they all lie in the same plane, right? And alpha is simply the magnitude of the displacement that we are doing. S is a unit vector, okay? So depending on the amount of shear you do, you will get a rotation of the force axis. But Normally, in an experiment, we maintain the force axis constant, don't we? Yeah, you know, if you have got a tensile testing machine, I it's not going to rotate its upper half with respect to its lower half, right? So instead of that, the crystal will rotate, right? And uh, this is just a stereographic representation of exactly what I said earlier, that F dashed is the sum of F and alpha S. So F dash will tend to move towards the shear direction as you deform the crystal. Uh, okay, so because of uh, the constraint, we imagine that the crystal, well, in real reality, if you constrain the force axis, then the crystal uh, planes will rotate. And the consequence of that is if you have a polycrystalline material, and in all the different crystals, you've got different slip systems operating because the Schmidt factor is different. Nevertheless, the slip planes will all tend to rotate towards the force axis, F dash. And therefore, even if you started off with a random set of crystals, you would end up with some sort of alignment of slip planes and slip directions. Okay? 
and that is uh, what leads one factor which can lead to the formation of texture in other words non random orientations of grains even if you started with a random orientation of polycrystals. Is everyone happy with that? So, you know as soon as you process your material whether it is by deformation or by applying a magnetic field while the polycrystals are transforming from the parent phase uh, or so on uh, or recrystallizing the material you will end up with a non-random distribution of crystals. There is only one way that I know of where you could actually produce a completely random set of polycrystals and that is using powder metallurgy. So, you create powders, you consolidate them and sinter them and then they are in random orientations. Okay? Um, otherwise, you will always have something between a single crystal and a polycrystal. Okay, now uh, these are the slip systems for body centered cubic and face centered cubic uh, metals. How, how do we determine what the likely slip system is going to be? You know, why should the 111 plane be the slip plane for FCC? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, close back planes. Uh, and physically, what's the reason why a closed pack plane would be easier to slip on? Uh, so, so we haven't got to the displacement yet, but imagine that you've got atoms closed packed. Then the next plane will only have to move over small bumps, right? But if it's not closed packed, then the next plane sits deeper into that crystal, so it has to move over larger bumps, right? And of course, you know the uh, amount of displacement that you do should also be as small as possible to make slip easier. So, a close back direction will be the smallest uh, lattice vector and therefore, that uh, becomes your Burgers vector. So, in FCC 111 plane is close backed and the 110 type direction in that plane uh, represents the uh, close back direction. So, half 1 bar 10 in this case would be the Burgers vector of your dislocation. And in the BCC, why is it the 110 plane? There is no close back plane, right, in BCC, but it is the most densely packed plane. Okay, so, if you look at the arrangement of atoms at the corners and in the middle of that plane, then it is like a squashed hexagon, whereas in the 111, it would be a hexagonal arrangement. All right? So, 110 is the most closely packed plane in BCC. And of course, 111 is a close back direction. So, A by 2, 111 will be the Burgers vector in BCC. And what about hexagonal? Close back, sorry? Basal plane. Basal plane is exactly like the 111 of FCC. And um, direction, uh, the Burgers vector? Um, Four index notation. Uh, <laughs> okay. 001 changed into 4 indices, yeah? yeah? Okay. Uh, no, 001 is uh, the normal to the basal plane, 100, zero zero. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the slip systems are determined by uh, the easiest uh, displacement of uh, planes past each other. Okay, now I said to you that, uh, you know, uh, if I just go back, um, there are 24 different possibilities in each of those case cases because you know 111 I can have 11 bar 1 1 bar 1 1 bar 1 1 1 and then there are six variants of 110 you can permute 110 in six different ways not counting the opposites yeah so 6 times uh, sorry how is that right 6 times 4 is 24 right yeah okay so 24 <laughs> variants okay um it's early in the morning. So, there are 24 possibilities. So, you would have to work out 24 different Schmidt factors, right? But there is an easy way of doing this and a very, very easy proof of it as well and this is known as uh, Deal's rule. Have you come across this before? Okay. So, look here is your stereographic projection and it does not matter whether it is BCC or FCC is exactly identical for the two cases and supposing that 
my tensile axis is over here. Okay. Now remember that uh, cos lambda cos phi is a maximum when both cos lambda cos phi is a maximum when lambda and phi equal 45 degrees. All right. Just some very quick uh, calculations. So, what is the angle between 0, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 1? Um, sorry? Yeah? No, 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 no. That's between the face diagonal and the edge. It's, uh, it's 50 55 degrees, okay? And the angle between 0, 01 and 101 is 45 degrees and that is uh, smaller than 45 degrees, okay? So if I, if I put my tensile axis in here and let's say that the 111 plane is a slip plane and 101 is a slip direction, then uh, first of all, these two are not both going to be at 45 degrees to that direction, right? And furthermore, 101 does not lie in the 111 plane. So that cannot be the slip system operated by this tensile axis. On the other hand, if I look at the next uh, nearest uh, slip direction okay, uh, and the next nearest slip plane, you can see that these two actually are at 90 degrees to each other because if you take a dot product, that gives you 0. Yeah? 1 bar 1 1 and 0 1 1, if you take a dot product, uh, must give you 0 because the slip direction must lie in the slip plane. If you pick any other combination of 1, 1, 1 and 0 bar 1, 1, you can show for, uh, for yourself that you will not get uh, anything near 45 degrees. Okay? So all you have to do is place your tensile axis wherever it is. Okay? Um, go to the nearest 1, 0, 1 and the one opposite will be the correct slip direction. And similarly, I place my tensile <coughs> axis here, go to the nearest 1, 1, 1, and the one opposite will be the slip plane, which gives you the maximum Schmidt factor. Okay? And all because you know, we want lambda and phi to be as close to 45 degrees as possible. If you use any other combination, you'll see very quickly that that doesn't give you angles close to 45 degrees. Okay? So that's called uh, Deal's rule. Everyone happy with that? So I don't need to do 24 different calculations, you know. Um, yeah. Can this work for uh, are, 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 are like written in cubic or uh, this particular example I've given you is for cubic, yeah. But, oh, I, but this rule is it for other ones? So, you know, for hexagonal it is uh, it is very very trivial because you have just the basal plane. And therefore, you know, you are just trying to find the angle which will give you the maximum shear stress. Yeah. So there are three possibilities. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you are just lifting your the cord. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to say something. Yeah. So when we talked about the deformation of a single crystal, we said that the force axis tends to move towards the slip direction, right? As we deform because we are constraining the sample and therefore the force axis will move uh, towards the slip direction. Uh, so instead of the crystal uh, force axis moving, we think about the crystal moving. So as I start to deform this single crystal, which direction will it move towards? Because it's rotating, the crystal is rotating relative to the force axis. Yeah. So I've got my tensile axis initially here, but as a shear, it's not going to stay in the same position, right? So, how do I find where it's going to move? Yeah. Yeah. So, if I draw a great circle containing the tensile axis and 0, 1, 1, then it will move towards, uh, along that great circle, towards 0, 1, 1. Okay? comes from that simple vector equation where f dash equals f plus s.
what happens when the tensile axis hits this edge? <coughs> yeah. So, you will stimulate another slip system to operate as well and how do I find that? Well, if I put the tensile axis slightly into this stereographic triangle, go to the nearest 0, 1, 1 and the one opposite defines the slip direction. Okay. Then now you have got the crystal slipping both along 011 1 and 101. Okay. You have got two slip systems operating. So, which direction will the force axis move in? You have got two slip directions operating and let us say they are operating with exactly equal shears. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but just add 101 and 011, 112. So it will move. Uh, so this tensile axis moves to this point <coughs> and then it starts moving towards 112. 112 lies uh, between 001 and 111. If I add 001 and 111, I get 112, right? So it will start moving towards the 112 direction. Okay. If I have two slip systems operating, if I'm at a corner where there are, you know, six different stereographic triangles, one, two, three, four, five, six, then I'll have six slip systems operating. Now, bear in mind that a real crystal is much more complicated, that you won't have equal amounts of shear on both slip systems and so on. So this is just, uh, just for illustration purposes. And what do you expect to see in terms of the stress to slip the crystal? when you have just one slip system operating and when you have two, what, what, what consequence would that have? You get enormous increase in work hardening. Okay? So, as soon as you have multiple slip systems operating, you have enormous uh, amount of work hardening. And if you have a polycrystalline material, how many slip systems must you have as a minimum to avoid fracture? Five. Yeah, we did that in an earlier lecture, right? <coughs> okay. So this is just the illustration of the two slip systems operating at the same time. Okay. Okay. Now, um, when we have a, a lump of uh, material and we are going to deform it let's say by rolling, then there is an external frame of reference which is the rolling direction, the transverse direction and the normal to the plane of the sheet which is being rolled. Okay. So, that is the external frame of reference and inside our material we have a, a, a set of crystals in many different orientations. Right. Now, thi this is a rolling mill uh, which is the called a planetary rolling mill. So, there are large rolls outside and very, very small rolls in the middle and it is used for making uh, razor blades which are very, very thin, right? stainless steel razor blades. Now, why do we have to have these very large rolls and then a very small roll in the middle? Yeah, uh, so to make a very thin material you need a small diameter roll, okay? but that is very flexible. So, you need to support that roll with a whole cluster of other rolls. Uh, so, that is by the way. But basically, we have got an external frame of reference with uh, and we have to describe the orientations of the crystals within your material uh, with respect to that frame to see whether they are randomly oriented or whether they are aligned in some way. Okay? Okay, and uh, texture, uh, because when we roll the slip planes tend to align and the slip directions tend to align along the rolling direction. We describe texture uh, uh, in, in a very simple equation that you have these planes aligned along a particular, whoops, particular direction and the directions within those planes are aligned along a particular direction and you may have a combination of texture. So, for example, if HKL is 1 on 1 and UVW is 1 bar 1 0, those planes tending to align because of the complexity of deformation you may also have another set like 
zero, zero, 001 aligning along the rolling direction. And you can say, okay, the fraction of the zero, zero, 001 type texture is 0.2 and the fraction of the 111 type texture is point uh, point 0.8. Okay? So that's just a simple way of describing the extent of the texture that you have. Now this uh, I claim, uh, so I've got a stereographic projection now, and it's not plotted with respect to the crystallographic axis. It's plotted with respect to the external frame of reference. So we have the rolling direction, transverse direction, and the normal direction is pointing out from the uh, plane of the board. So you know, if, if this is my sample, that's the normal direction, that's the uh, transverse direction, and the rolling direction along here. Okay. And the dots that I'm plotting are the three zero zero one poles of one crystal. And then I find where the zero zero one poles of all the other crystals are and plot them with respect to the external frame of reference. Okay. So that's uh, that's called a pole figure. Now here the crystals are oriented at random with respect to the external frame of reference. But can you see uh, that the density of poles is not uniform, right? So how can I say this is random? We have angular distortion. So here, uh, the same area <coughs> represents a smaller angle compared with the center. So this truly is random because it's generated by a computer. Okay? Uh, and <coughs> the non-uniformity of <coughs> the <coughs> of the density of poles is simply a reflection of the angular distortion. <coughs> Everyone happy with this uh, pole figure? <coughs> You could, but you know, um, this can be very confusing uh, because people often don't specify uh, what they're doing. And you know, if you go on the scanning electron microscope, you have both options, and it causes confusion. Yeah. <coughs> but you are ha almost never likely to get a random distribution, okay? But everyone happy with the concept? of a pole figure that um, I'm plotting the external frame of reference on the stereogram <coughs> and each each crystal will have three 110 type directions and I'm plotting the orientation of the cube edges of that crystal with respect to the external frame and doing it for every single crystal inside our material okay <coughs> Now, when I roll that material, the crystals will tend to align. And this is typically the sort of pattern that you might see on your pole figure. That now, you know, you are somewhere between a random polycrystal and a single crystal. It's obviously not a single crystal because if uh, all the crystals were exactly aligned, I would just have one dot here, one dot here, and one dot here. Okay? But you've got a cloud around each of those poles. So when you see <coughs> something like this, <coughs> uh, you, you know that your material is not um, a random polycrystal. <coughs> now, I gave you this example when we were introduced stereograms in the first place, <coughs> that we can use stereographic projections for plotting properties, and in this case we are plotting the elastic modulus of iron. And I also explained that we have 24 of these stereographic triangles. And each one of these stereographic triangles has a 0, zero 001 uh, pole here, uh, and then a 111 and a 011 pole. If you look at this, you know, if I, I take any one of these stereographic triangles, you can represent the whole of that stereogram just by a single stereographic triangle because of the symmetry. So, you know, you'll have a high mod uh, a low modulus 
at the 0, 0, 1 position, you'll have a high modulus at the 1, 1, 1 position and something in between at the 0, 1, 1 position. So very often um, with cubic systems, you will on only be presented with a stereographic triangle instead of the whole stereogram and you can generate the whole stereographic triangle just by stacking them together. Okay. <coughs> So these are uh, stereographic triangles and in this case I'm using crystallographic axes. So this is 0, 0, 1, uh, that's uh, the, um, let me see, zero, zero, yeah, so that's the 0, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 1 and I'm plotting the normal direction on those stereographic projections. So we call this an inverse pole figure. The original pole figure I showed you was plotted with the external frame of reference, but you know you can do it in the inverse way that you choose a particular crystal inside your material, draw the stereogram, and then plot all the normal rolling and uh, uh, transverse directions on that stereogram. So that's an inverse pole figure. And you end up with lots of dots, and there are different ways of representing this. You could take these dots and just plot, uh, you know, density contours. So I, I have a large number of dots here and very few dots here, etc. Okay. So you can see both types, or you can see colors. So if you go to your scanning electron microscope, it will present this information in the form of colors. Okay. <coughs> Now, how do we determine the orientation of every single crystal inside our material? There are many techniques, all right, but they all rely on diffraction. But a very common technique that's used nowadays, because it's so simple, is electron backscattered diffraction, uh, and that relies on the fact that you know you've got your uh, your in a scanning electron microscope, the electron beam is actually doing that, right, and looking at the intensity at each pixel and plotting the image, right? It's, it's, uh, that's why it's called a scanning electron microscope. Now, if you look at uh, this diagram, there will be particular angles of that electron beam where, you know, these planes will diffract the beam into the material, right? So, at these positions, you will get very little intensity going to the detector, okay? So, at, the, at these exact Bragg conditions when the beam is inclined correctly, it's being uh, diffracted into the sample. So you get diffraction patterns like this, where the dark regions are where the electrons are going into your sample and very few going to the detector. So from these channeling patterns, the machine has the software to generate your pole figure by scanning across your whole sample, whatever the grains a number of grains you have in that scanned region and so on. And it's amazing now, you know, you don't just look at the microstructure, that means the shape and size of grains, but you also have absolutely detailed crystallographic information. Uh, of course, what you do with it is also very clever and requires a lot of work, uh, but um, to obtain the information is almost trivial now. Okay, uh, and this is a typical example of an electron backscattered image, where you know the colors uh, are, are artificial, where they represent a particular orientation, and you will, along with this, you would have a stereographic triangle showing you know red color corresponds to one 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 or whatever. Okay. Okay. So. This is a, a model plane that I've borrowed from uh, Professor Lindsay Greer. It's uh, from the 1920s, made out of uh, Meccano. What I want to illustrate to you is how we define the orientation of this plane with respect to an external frame of reference. So there are three uh, operations that we can think of. First of all, we'll rotate it about the normal to the wing, okay. so that's uh, an action which we call yaw. Then there is the pitch action where the aircraft goes up or down, and then the rolling action like so. 
Now these three rotations help to define the orientation of the plane with respect to an external frame of reference. We can use the same principle to define the orientation of a crystal with respect to an external frame of reference and the angles involved in the rotation you'll see shortly are called the Euler angles. So with three different rotation operations you can define the orientation of the plane with respect to a frame of reference. Okay? And then you can be told, okay, correct to this or that or other, or apply at this altitude and so on. <coughs> we do the same thing for crystals. Um, we can define the orientation of a crystal with respect to a frame of reference using three angles, which are called the Euler angles. And I'm going to illustrate this, okay? So it's all in your notes. Uh, so just pay attention, all right? <coughs> So this is my, uh, these are my crystal axes, <coughs> and these are my external axes, which represent, you know, the normal direction, the rolling direction, and the transverse direction, okay? And what I want to do is to find operations which will bring those two sets of axes into exact coincidence, because that defines the three Euler angles, okay? So by the time we finish these axes, with these three operations will be exactly on these uh, crystallographic axes. Okay? So the first thing I do is I draw a great circle containing the rolling direction and the transverse direction. And what I want to do is I want to move uh, this rolling direction so that it's at 90 degrees to the plane containing that and that. Okay? So I, I do uh, I want the rolling direction to be at 90 degrees to the plane containing the z-axis of the crystal and the normal direction. So there we go. Okay. If I just rotate uh, about the normal direction so that the rolling direction comes onto the perimeter, then that's at 90 degrees to the plane containing these two. And that angle is the first Euler angle, phi 1. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's straightforward. <coughs> and there's a little image of that plane doing the rotation about the normal direction. Okay, so that's the definition of the first Euler angle. Then we rotate about the new position of the rolling direction here, rotate about RD dashed, so that the normal direction becomes coincident with the z-axis of the crystal, okay, and the transverse direction moves to this position. Everyone happy with that? That uh, gives us the second Euler angle, which is phi, uh, capital phi. <coughs> um, and then we ro uh, s rotate about, uh, no, this is just a repetition of uh, what I just said, phi. Okay. Now we rotate about the new position of the normal direction, in other words, the z-axis of the crystal, to bring Rd dashed into coincidence with 1, 0, 0, and that automatically brings T, uh, the transverse direction, into coincidence with that. So that gives us the third Euler angle, and you can see now that the external axes are exactly coincident with the crystal axes. So the normal direction is parallel to 0, 0, 1, the rolling direction to 1, 0, 0, and the transverse direction to 0, 1, 0. So that gives us the three Euler angles. Okay. And this is summarized in your notes um, that we start uh, with uh, a great circle containing the rolling direction and the transverse direction <coughs> because we want to get the rolling direction to be at 90 degrees to the plane containing the normal and the 0, 0, 1. And that gives us the angle phi 1. We then rotate about the new position of the rolling direction so that the normal direction becomes coincident with 0, 0, 1. That gives us uh, this uh, capital phi. And then we rotate about the 0, 0, 1 uh, uh, axis, which is parallel to the normal direction, to bring the rolling direction to this position and the transverse direction to this, and mission accomplished. All right. So those are the three Euler angles which define 
the orientation of a crystal with respect to your external frame of reference. Now, why, why is this uh, useful? Yeah. In this pole figure, I see lots of dots, and there will be three 100 zero zero poles for every crystal, right? But I, I don't know whether you know, these three dots come from a particular crystal, this dot, this dot, and this dot, uh, and these three from another crystal. So I can't determine the relationships between crystals. Okay? It's just telling me that there is a certain amount of texture. What ideally I'd like to do is not just have the orientation of the crystal, but if I want to work out the orientation between this crystal and this crystal, I should be able to do it, right? So that would be a complete description. Now, with Euler angles, that becomes extremely uh, easy to do. I take a cube, and the axes of the cube are the three Euler angles. Right? So what does each dot <coughs> represent? It's the orientation of a single crystal, complete definition of the orientation of the single crystal, right? And another dot gives me the orientation of the second crystal because with another set of Euler angles, and therefore I know exactly the relationship between different crystals. Okay? So this is called an orientation distribution function, and a pole figure is a subset of this. You can generate a pole figure if you have an orientation distribution function. Now, obviously, you know, we will be dealing with uh, thousands and thousands of crystals. Yeah? So looking at a cube uh, is not very helpful when you have thousands and thousands of crystals. So what you do is you take sections of this cube along particular values of the Euler angle. So, so for example, here phi 2 is set to 45 degrees. And the distribution of dots on that section will look like that. And if it's another angle, it will look like that. And generally speaking, uh, you know, your scanning electron microscope or other facility will generate sections of the orientation distribution function and plot the contours of the densities of those points. Okay? But all the quantitative information is available behind the scene, uh, behind the simple presentation. Okay? So these, these are the perfect way of defining uh, a crystallographic texture. Uh, gives you all the information that you need. Is everyone happy with that? So there's quite a few new concepts here. Yeah. OK, now um, actually that finishes today's lecture. But this book, you know, is really, really nice, and you can just download it uh, from uh, the teaching website. And it could be Christmas readings, you know? Okay, so I'll finish there. <laughs>